Toys in the Attic is a 2009 stop-motion film which focuses on the lives of a group of toys living in a household attic. You probably could have guessed that from the title. Though being first released in the Czech Republic in 2009, it was actually internationally produced by multiple countries – France, Japan, and Slovakia – with an English dub later being released on August 2012. And again, this is one of those films I'd never heard of before, but saw requested down in the comments, so do keep letting me know of any films you'd like me to check out. Toys in the Attic is classed as a stop-motion, animated fantasy, comedy, thriller, family film. Christ, that has more tags on it than an Instagram post. And interestingly enough, out of all the tags they chose for it, they forgot to include horror. As yes, although technically a kid's film, it certainly does have a lot of creepy and disturbing moments throughout. But maybe that's not too surprising, considering it was directed by a chap named Jerry Barta who also directed the 1986 stop-motion film, The Pied Piper of Hamelin. But we'll cover that one in a later review. For now, let's take a look at the charming, yet also haunting, Toys in the Attic. But first, a quick shout out to this video's sponsor, Ridge Wallet. With its light, sleek, and industrial design that doesn't awkwardly bulge in your pocket. But tell me, Eddie, is that wallet in your pocket? Are you just happy to see me? You can certainly see the size difference from my old wallet. There's over 30 colors and styles to choose from, including burnt titanium and carbon fiber, which is the one I personally went for. Ridge Wallet comes with a lifetime warranty, plus a 45 day free trial, so if for whatever reason you're not satisfied with your purchase, you can send it back and get a full refund. Just head on over to ridge.com forward slash Steve Reviews and use the code Steve Reviews to get 10% off today, plus free shipping and returns. Thank you so much guys, now back to the review. The film opens up on an old school toy catalogue where we get a brief introduction to our characters, including Mr. Terrifying, Dr. I Will Cut Out Your Soul, Meth Addict Mickey, and Five Nights at Teddy's. We then get introduced to these demented figures' lifestyles, as they live in an old trunk inside of the attic. Here we have Teddy, Sir Handsome, Buttercup, and Laurent. And no, these two don't have an established relationship in the film, Laurent just doesn't know any personal boundaries. Throughout the day, the toys spend their time carrying out their intended roles, such as Teddy being the station master, Sir Handsome slaying the dragon, Good grief. Hmm? You have pierced my dragon again. Hmm? You will now suffer immensely for this, and Buttercup, who stays at home to clean the house. Washing up and cooking dinner, wives, wives, wives. I gotta say, I absolutely love the creativity in this film. The station just looks so grand, and I love how the train isn't actually a train, but instead crafted out of a series of everyday objects. There's other little touches too, such as the 2D animation we get for the steam, the 2D colouring style we get for the characters through windows, and how the solid vehicles will actually disappear through little paper tunnels. Back at the trunk, Buttercup finds herself being spied on from something that looks like it came from War of the Worlds. The person spying on her is a creepy looking statue, who gives me PTSD flashbacks to that talking head from the kids show, Art Attack. The head decides that he wants Buttercup to be his wife, so uses the real life house cat who disguises himself to kidnap Buttercup. And not only can this real life cat now walk on two feet, but he is also able to talk. You have to jump down. No other choice. How can he do this exactly? Well, it's never explained. So we'll just go with the Coraline explanation for this. If you're the same cat, how can you talk? I just can. After the cat sends Buttercup in the wrong direction, she is then taken away by what is actually a pretty terrifying blanket. Family film. 
The other toys aren't too happy about this and so set out to try and rescue her. They seek help from a toy mouse named Madame Curie, who, to put it lightly, is a little bit insane. It's up to the very end of the world. A long and wretched journey. Yeah! The maniacal mouse agrees to help with the rescue and begins constructing a broadcast announcement whilst Teddy and Sir Handsome venture on. Meanwhile, Buttercup is brought to the head who asks her to become his wife. I must say, of all the characters in this film, the head is definitely the most interesting. Not from his personality, but just by how he animates. He's like a combination of a rubber puppet, which has a live action mouth edited over the top. Kinda reminds me of that white head we see in Courage the Cowardly Dog. But then in the other scenes, it looks like an actual person's head that has simply got makeup on. He also has this separate arm, which again, swaps from being a stop motion puppet to a live action one. Unlike me however, Buttercup is not impressed by the head, so he has her thrown into an old wood burner, warning that if she doesn't accept his proposal, that she will soon be fed to a bunch of cannibals. Oh yeah, remember those creepy looking toys from the original Toy Story that Woody and Buzz thought were cannibals? They're cannibals. Well, it's kind of like that here, only they're a lot creepier and are actually cannibals. <laughs> Family film. Back at base, Madame Curie has managed to send out a broadcast to the other toys. I am organizing a rescue mission. Come, all benches with a brave heart. And has constructed a plane to begin the rescue which does make me wonder just how big is this attic? Surely that plane would reach the other side of it in mere seconds. Meanwhile, the head has grown tired of Buttercup's stubborn ways and so has her taken down towards surgery where he somehow manages to find a creepy earwig surgeon that looks even worse than the demonic monkey. Due to the power cord reaching its limit, Madame Curie's plane ends up crashing, but thankfully Teddy and Sir Handsome are nearby so the gang all binds together and ventures on. The head sees the commotion and floods the attic with black bin bags in what is made to look like a pretty cool looking ocean. Thinking that he has sunk our heroes, the head celebrates with the party, where it seems that Buttercup has now been brainwashed. Things don't seem quite right however, as it appears that multiple Buttercups have been cloned. They do manage to find the original Buttercup, but the head is having none of it. Thanks to a bit of good fortune however, the toys manage to overpower the head and finish him off once and for all. Guess you could say that him and Buttercup have now broken up. Comedy. They managed to free the original Buttercup, but it appears that they may be too late. I know mouse to mouse. I, I swear! Yeah, sure you do, buddy. Fortunately though, Teddy has a magic plot convenient medicine on him, which manages to bring Buttercup back to life. And no, before you ask, we have never seen this medicine being used before, nor do we know what it actually is. So Buttercup is rescued, the head is destroyed, and the toys head back home. So all is good and happy. Well, except for the fact that all of the head's minions still exist and that there's now a bunch of Buttercup clones running about the place. But don't worry, the film actually makes sure to address this in the most what the fuck way possible. So as Teddy is getting ready to head back with the others, he notices a present on the floor that is addressed to him. He opens it up to find a pocket watch. And what happens next? I honestly don't know. The watch all of a sudden breaks apart and turns into a literal black hole, sucking everything around into it, no matter the size or weight. Like what? This conveniently also manages to suck in the head's henchmen and the buttercup clones, after which it simply returns back to normal and is never mentioned again. I'm not even kidding. 
I have never seen such a random device being used as such a convenient plot device. I mean, you thought Teddy's magic medicine was convenient? Well, just check out his black hole pocket watch. I did try figuring out what this watch could symbolize, and I think I might have a theory. Because the director of this film grew up during the Cold War period in the Czech Republic, you can see a lot of references put in which highlight dictatorship and corruption. And though I couldn't find anything online to confirm this, the theory I have is that the watch is meant to be a kind of personification of rolling back the clock to better times, times before the dictatorship took over. But that's just a theory. A film theory! But if you guys have any better thoughts on what it may symbolize, please do let me know in the comments section below. Anyway, the toys gather back at the trunk for a celebratory dinner, where the film ends and the credits roll. And that was Toys in the Attic. Now if I'm going to be completely honest, as far as the plot goes, this one's pretty basic. Toys come into life when the owners aren't about. It's been done. The all caring female character getting kidnapped so the others have to venture out and save her. It's been done. And as far as the characters themselves go, they're also pretty basic. No one really stands out as having a distinctive personality, or no character really goes through an arc in this entire film. I mean, Sir Handsome speaks in rhymes, I guess? What kind of spell has fate ignited to drive you to me so excited? And the mouse does that insane scream every now and then? Yeah! But other than that, there's not too much to them. But none of that really matters, as although there isn't much going on with the story or characters, the creativity through the visuals is what's going to keep you watching. There is so much going on in the world of this film, from the mechanical objects, to the feather pillow clouds, and the bin bags being made into a black sea. From a logical perspective, none of this makes sense. If the toys are meant to be existing in the real world, why are the bed sheets and bin bags being perceived as water, when actual water exists? Why is paper being perceived as fire, when actual fire exists? If this paper fire is actually heating the porridge, does that mean if a real human touches it, they would burn themselves? The thing is with this toy world in the attic, is that unlike films such as Toy Story where the toys are existing in the real world, this world is meant to be one seen through the imagination of a child. And this is revealed in an interview with the director. When I found an old exercise book with my drawing of a train made from old tickets with a piece of cigarette for the smokestack, the kid in my imagination reappeared. Edgar and I remembered the games we used to play in the strange forbidden places we found in our attics. And we see this reflected in the film. It is a world that a child would build. The train carriages are just suitcases, yet you can still see inside of them through windows which are drawn by a child. Even how the cat character causes the train to derail, I believe would be based on an actual memory. As I certainly remember when I was a kid, I had a train set of my own, and it wouldn't be uncommon for our cat to come in and knock them all over. Because as we know, cats are arseholes. But in saying that, if this film is taking place in a child's imagination, I don't know why it chose to include the real life human characters as it kind of breaks the reality. The human characters don't even have much impact on the plot. They appear for like one scene where the girl puts Buttercup onto a set of drawers, and that's really it. I feel like the Lego movie handled this better, for the most part, but even then I think it could have been better off without them. As for the animation, well it's a mixed bag. The animation on the characters themselves isn't actually too great. Movements really aren't that fluid, especially if you were to compare them to other stop motion films such as Coraline or The Isle of Dogs. In fact, the motion quality seemed more in line to what you'd expect on a lower budget TV series. Facial expressions are also pretty limited. I noticed with Buttercup especially that in order to express shock on her face, they literally just rotated her eyes around, which now means that her eyelids are on the side. Ugh. However, it's not all that bad, as where the animation does shine through is from the set pieces, from the motion of the train, and there's a nice little sequence in the middle of blue sheets flowing like a river. 
And as mentioned before, I do really like the combination of different styles, such as the 2D, claymation, and even live action. So, final thoughts. If you're a fan of stop motion animation, I'd say go check this film out. It's visually satisfying to watch and has a bit of a nostalgic feel with its old school look. Would I recommend this to kids? Mm, possibly. It's definitely something that they could sit down and enjoy watching, but just don't be too surprised if they end up having nightmares for a few days afterwards. Anyway, that's all for today. Thank you so much for watching guys, please like if you enjoyed, and leave comments below on your thoughts on the film, and of course, any recommendations you have for future reviews. And until the next one, take care.